Hello everyone and welcome to Of God and Mind. We're returning now to our Acts series, starting in Acts chapter 2, 36. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So here we have, this is all happening just after the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and Peter's big speech there, which we've gone through in the past three episodes. And this gives us sort of our closest look at how the very early church, this very beginning sort of the church, lived, along with bits coming up in the next few chapters. Apart from this, we don't have a whole lot of idea on how the early church, like sort of uh, first century church, acted. We have better evidence as we go later on through uh, Roman um, writers and so forth as it starts to become a lot, the church starts to become a lot bigger. And this is a little different, what we see here, to what it's like then. So it's pretty tricky to make out what to do with this and how this should, how our churches look. Should we still act like this? Should we act more like churches as they went later on? I don't know. So I won't be commenting too much on that. I'll just be talking about what the passage has and does not have here. So... This sort of starts with um, Peter giving this, well first it starts with Peter's speech, but then Peter continues talking to them apparently for quite a while. So he sort of has his call, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So this guy that we've told you about that is the true Lord of David who did not see death. Um, who's coming allowed this um, spirit, this great miracle, to come on us. Uh, repent of the things you're doing in your life. Tear your hearts, not your garments. And come under the name of this servant of God, your uh, prophesied king, your Messiah, Jesus Christ. And you too can receive this gift of the Holy Spirit within you and not just upon you like our fathers so and he also says this promise is for everyone for you gathered here you you of you Jews of many nations and God fearers and for all of those even those from the nations you are from from the Gentiles for your children for everyone so then we have this other bit here where wait not that one this bit here where he discusses about how well where the author of Acts um, says that this is only part of Peter's, Peter's speech essentially so with many other words he warned them so he gave them a lot more instruction than what we have here he taught them presumably the basics of Christianity a lot of how to live stuff presumably, given this message of save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So this is how Christ would have wanted you to live, the 
differences between that and your current Judaism, that sort of stuff. And then, and a lot of people go along with this. 3,000 added to that number that day. And then we get onto the sort of uh, little glimpse of the early church where all these people, they've devoted themselves to the te teaching of these apostles to the, and to the sort of uh, the rituals of the early church, the sacraments, communion essentially is the one they mentioned, the breaking of bread and to prayer. So that's a sacrament, if you hear that word, it's basically anything that it's considered that Jesus commanded us to do and there's only really two of them. There's communion because Jesus said at the Last Supper um, after breaking the bread and blessing the cup and handing that around, do this in remembrance of me. Um, and he says in the Great Commission, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So those are the two things that most Christian groups will consider a sacrament because they're a ritual that Jesus commanded us to keep doing. So we see that the early believers do this here, and we know from other sources too that they did this, such as the uh, letter to um, Tiberius, I think. I can f I'll find that and do it in a later video. It's not too important at the moment. But then we've got some really radical sort of commune stuff here, almost. Uh, that's how it would be seen today. So the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had in need. So, it's a little hard to work out exactly what's being said here, because it's kind of giving their way of life in, like, three passages. So, did, does, they were all, they were together and had everything in common mean that they all lived together in some big house somewhere? and they shared everything, like a sort of, like a commune, like I mentioned, or is it a more general, they spent a lot of time together, Israel's, uh, ancient Israeli society was very communal anyway, with shared houses and so forth, is this just sort of a communication of that, and they met together a lot, and if anyone had need, they would give them that stuff. Did they sell all their possessions to start with and share them, or is that means if they saw one of their brothers struggling and in poverty or in debt or whatever, then one of their one of the members of themselves, brothers or sisters, I'm falling into a bit of jargon here, but anyway, uh, did they only sell of stuff that they didn't need or that they had excess of and to give to help those among them who were in need? Um, we do see that they continued to meet together every day, so they were definitely very together here. And uh, their like the breaking of bread, their communion doesn't quite look like how we do it now. It was actually more sharing a meal together, sort of like the Last Supper. These days, it's we've got it very ritualized. It's just a little piece of bread, but they would have had a whole feast of it. And we see that later on when the disputes arise and distributing the food and so forth. That it's clearly more than a little uh, slight, a little cube of bread and a little glass of uh, wine or juice. But anyway, whatever these people were doing, the, it was quite popular. They were praising God all day and they enjoyed the favor of everyone. Everyone liked them. Thought they were pretty cool dudes. And among this, in this being well, I shouldn't say because of this popularity, because of what God was doing among them, because of the difference that everyone could see in them. Um, it was quite attractive to a lot of people, and the Lord was adding daily to their to the people who believed that Jesus Christ was the Savior. So that's sort of our quick vision of the early church. We see a little bit more of that. We'll see a little bit more of that in the coming chapters. But anyway, that's all for today. See you next time.